Hey, what's up guys? Tuki here, back again with another episode of my Vegas Golden Knights franchise mode series. We're at the deadline of the 2024-2025 season, and needless to say, things have gone quite well. And while I hope this is just the beginning, obviously a deep playoff run with this team and with the way this team's performing would be tremendous, we do still have to look at this at a moment-to-moment -moment basis, so I'm not going to say I'm overly excited. I'm optimistic, which is never really great in this game as a way of crushing my hopes and dreams over and over again, but we'll get to that. For now, it's hope and optimism. Before we get into the main uh, meat and potatoes of this episode, let's get to a couple of your comments. Polly, here is the thing. This has a discussion on both series as far as me not taking uh, you know, players with de-skating. It doesn't affect the sim that much. The problem is, we don't stick to just simming from the main menu. We jump into the game and watch the AI play, and that is where I've noticed quite a few players with that lower skating not exactly being all that much of a positive. Maybe not outright a detriment, but certainly not that great. So, if it means, you know, we look at a scouting report and someone has B- minus shooting, but D skating. Am I going to take someone that has C shooting and C skating? Yeah, more than likely. I'm going to look for the more well-rounded players. Is that the best way to go about it? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not going to say it's the perfect way. Uh, hell, we don't have any success in this series, so maybe it isn't. But still, that's the way I go about it. So that's just my thought process on it. You can agree with it. You can disagree with it. Regardless, it is what it is. Uh, Matt Prezak, have I adjusted any settings? I haven't, and much like I responded to you, I haven't changed anything with the settings. Because the second I do, people will be like, well, that's the reason you won, is because you changed settings. Even if I didn't change anything, you know, specifically for human-controlled players, even though I never play a second of the game. So, no, we do not change anything to adjust the scoring or anything like that. Uh, Christopher Letang, the real Christopher Letang, clearly. Um, the roster editing video, like I responded here, will be out whenever EA is able to get more missing AHL players into the roster. My understanding is like 20 to 40, maybe even you know, 30 to 40, that are still missing, and I don't feel like adding in that many players when they are going to do it eventually. Uh, if it gets down to like, oh, there's a dozen missing players, sure. I'll go ahead and add them in at that time, but right now, with the Vegas series and with the Golden Seal series still going strong, I'm not really feeling the need to be like, oh, I gotta make sure I fix the rosters now. Like, no, I'm gonna wait for EA to do that, but once we start to wind down the two ongoing franchise mode series and get ready to start up a new one, that's around the time that I'll start putting in a lot of heavy work to the roster editing. Uh, maybe not as much work as I've previously done, I'm not entirely sure, we'll figure that out. But, yeah, there will be a roster editing video in due time. That said, pretty much every other comment related to the idea of handling the re-signings now. Which, I was kind of planning on doing, admittedly. Uh, I just wanted to show you guys in the last episode, of course, what the cap situation is going to be. Where we do have to move a couple of players, right? We pretty much know that. But in terms of keeping this team together now for the playoff run... Yeah, I mean, there's no question that's exactly what we're going to do. But, like I said, and like I showed in that last episode, we are going to have to move players eventually. It's just, it's going to happen. We're not going to have the cap space to keep this super team together, uh, at least to this level, with every current member beyond this season. Uh, but still, we have them for this season, so maybe it will be a special year. So let's actually go ahead and explore that. I mean, at least with the big-time names, getting them locked down first, and the biggest name of all is Russell Clausen, who only wants that five-year deal. But again, I just he's going to be expensive no matter what, right? So like we talked about, that would be a $13.8 million deal, roughly. Whereas if we gave him the term that he wanted, it would be $12 million. I would rather pay uh, the extra $1.8 million to keep him for an extra three years. Seems worth it to me, right? So, we'll try 13.8, which is a lot, but we'll try it. We'll see what happens, considering our McDavid contract there. Granted, he's not going to be the only amazing player on this team. So, we'll see what happens with Russell and Marvin Mason. I didn't expect him to end up being this good, but my God, has he turned into an absolute monster. I guess playing with Russell Clausen. Uh, can do that, but he's not exactly Ty Ratty. Uh, so this would be 
about a $10.6 million offer minimum on an eight-year deal, whereas if we go with the five-year deal, it would be just over 7.5. So that's that's kind of a tough one, where I would love to get him signed for eight years, but maybe it would be smarter to just go for the five. It could be. So again, 7.5. Over five years. This is tough, man. It's a tough decision because this could help us uh, keep more players around, to be honest. 10.6 for eight years. I think I think we might just go with the five. I mean, I imagine that we're going to keep Mason for quite a while. But, yeah, I mean, goddamn. Why not? I mean, it doesn't jump in uh, in terms of asking price until you go to that sixth year. So I think, to be honest, I'm not going to go eight years for him. We'll try to save a decent amount of money with him. Let's go 7525, which is the cheapest he would possibly accept. And we'll see if he does. If not, maybe we'll explore the eight-year option. Uh, Goldobin and Lackey also need deals. <laughs> oh, boy, this is going to be tough. So kind of a similar thing. Although, actually, you know what? Goldobin's going to be cheap enough that we could go with the full eight years that could work it would drop to about seven and a half seven and a half over eight years for goldobin pretty good from what i can tell and again we wouldn't be saving that much more money a million at best i believe so let's see that's 8.8 .8. yeah i mean we could drop it down to like six i'd rather just get him for the eight years because he might improve he's only 21 and still medium elite so we will try the eight-year contract for him and then elijah lackey has another contract that's somewhat similar to what Mason's asking for, where beyond the fifth year, it starts to go up a little bit. Maybe we could go six. What would it be? Now that, I mean, because it's been a couple of days since I recorded this last time. Uh, it would be 8.33. So 835 for eight years. That, we, uh, that will attempt. Again, these are like the base minimal offers that they would accept with the 85% trick. It's as low as we can possibly go if we hope for that to work. We'll see what happens. I mean, again, with Mason, I'd love to send him the eight-year deal, but I have a feeling the five might be that much better. So we will not be making any trades at the deadline. It's full steam ahead towards the playoffs, and any moves that need to be made will be made at the draft to make sure that we can keep the players that we want to keep. Claussen has accepted. He is here for eight years. Elijah Lackey has accepted. Mason has accepted. Goldobin rejected. Uh, that is off of cap space, though. So let's go take a look at that whole situation, shall we? So again, Mason on a five-year deal rather than an eight-year deal to try and keep the majority of players on this team. And if we look again... Goldobin, what are we at now, money-wise? 7 to 8. So I think Goldobin might have to wait. I think Goldobin might have to wait. Now, there is that window between the draft and the re-sign phase. There's one day where you can still kind of get, like, a mid-season re-signing type of bargains, and that might be the day to sign Goldobin. Everybody else I'm not as concerned about, but as we have discussed... In terms of players who are probably going to be on the way out, I mean, that James Neal contract's going to go. Uh, Dwyer so still could go. Glass, although he's been great. We've talked about this and who could potentially go. But uh, Russell Clausen, eight years at 13.8. Lackey, eight years at 8.35. And Mason, five years at 7.525. So still, we are going to have one hell of a team moving forward in the next few years. But we will worry about the rest of that contract negotiations, who stays, who goes at the end of the season. For now, it is full steam ahead towards the playoffs and, again, hopefully a long playoff run. That would be nice. Let's sim midway through March and we'll see what happens from there. As far as our luck this season, time will tell whether or not it uh, continues going the way it has from an injury perspective course right as I talk about it we'll go assistant coach replace best player he's only out for a week at most so that's not too bad uh, Shea Theodore again might be one of those players on the way out I don't know I don't even want I really don't even want to think about it anymore we re-signed a couple of our big players from there let's just hope that we win so Eklund was able to get some playing time which is nice he's been kind of one of the sacrifices 
uh, in terms of him just sitting there, uh, thanks to the way we have the roster set up. By the way, I put Fotinos on the power play. It's the only change I've made to the lineup because Gertsen was on the uh, power play, and he's not a major point getter. So I on he was there for his cannon of a shot, which I guess you could say, oh, well, he was generating rebounds, but maybe, maybe not. So I have Fotinos on the power play now. We'll see what he can do. And I also bumped up Bronstrom to the top unit with Provorov, and we'll see if he benefits more from that. Which, to be honest, maybe he won't because he was the main defenseman on that second pairing. Maybe that was um, the big uh, contributor to his success, as Cody Glass is going to be out for a couple of days. That's not too bad. So we might have James Neal as our top-line center against Calgary, but I'm willing to run with that. Central scouting, I don't really care much for. We end up beating the Flames 4-2. to two. Not bad. We only have one regulation loss this month. It was to Buffalo. Let's get Cody back into the lineup here. Neil, how did you do? <laughs> you have no points in 11 games. Not quite to the same level of some of the other veterans we've signed. Who was it? Ryan? Was it Ryan Getzloff? Who just put up like a crazy amount of points in limited games. That's happened with a couple of our veterans. I think at this point, I'm just going to sim to April 1st. I mean, there's really no controversy. There's nothing we have to look at lineup-wise. We're winning games. Although, as I say that, we've now lost three out of our last five and now four out of our last six. That's great. Yeah, let's tank it right at the end of the regular season. Maybe cost us the number one seed because I'm sure Vancouver is still lights out. We have responded, though. We're at 51 wins as of March or as of April 1st with four games left to go this season as we are two points clear of the Canucks, obviously playoff bound. But that's what I was worried about with those final few losses. Vancouver's right there. And that's going to be a problem. Because regardless, we have to go through one another on paper. Like, out of the Pacific Division, you cannot make it to the conference final without beating either Vegas, Vancouver, or both. Uh, of course, speaking to, like, if an Edmonton was able to beat us or the Canucks in the first round, because they're pretty much locked in as the three seed. I'm not going to talk about a certain point total that I see on screen right now. Let's go ahead follow along with this and see if we are the best team in the Pacific and because of that probably the best team in the NHL as we beat LA 4-2. to two. They're a non-playoff team. We're going to have a little bit of a tougher battle here against Arizona. A 40-win team. Can we get the job done? No, we cannot. So we play 44 wins Chicago and 43 wins San Jose back-to-back -to, -back to end the season. The Chicago Wolves on 44 wins, by the way. They should be a playoff team. Let's take a look here. We're two points clear, and we've clinched it. We have clinched it. The best Vancouver can do is tie us, and we have tiebreaker. So we are the Pacific Division champions, and we know... Oh God, we know that we're pretty much the best team in the league, are we not? Actually, we're battling it out with Tampa Bay. All right, so we, we still need to win here if we want to be the top team in the league, but we know that we have home ice up until the final. Tampa can only tie us, I believe. 22 losses. I'm pretty sure we're the best team in the league, no matter what. But let's see if we can beat San Jose. We beat Chicago 7-4, uh, and we beat San Jose 6-2. Your Vegas Golden Knights, 54-21-7. The best team in the NHL. Absolutely ridiculous. We end up beating Vancouver by four to win the division title, and we end up beating Tampa by four as well. So there you go, 115 points. We average 3.79 goals for per game, scoring nine uh, nine more goals than Tampa. We were one of two teams to break 300 goals on uh, for the season, uh, which is ridiculous. It's going to say on the season, for the season. You get the point. Goals against a 2-4-6 average, which was the third lowest number in the league, lower than Tampa and Vancouver, for that matter. Buffalo had a really good defense. They won 46 games. Okay, that would explain it. And New Jersey was also great. So there you go. We're in pretty elite company. Our power play percentage was at 28.9%. Of course, you could see it up top as well. That was the third best in the league. And our penalty kill at 79.5% was okay mid table so we might want to we might want to address who is the personnel on those uh on those pk units it might be worth changing some things up 
Uh, let's take a look here. 32-7-2 at home. An absolute fortress. And if T-Mobile Arena continues to be that, uh, teams are going to have a very tough time in the playoffs. Let's take a look here. Actually, let's hold a team meeting first. Let's hold a team meeting, shall we? Let's do this. Uh, we're the proud recipients of the President's Trophy Boys, and truth be told, I won't be happy unless we win the one trophy that matters. <laughs> well, you know, that's kind of true. That's kind of true. Uh, this trophy won't mean anything if we choke in the playoffs. That is also true, you know? Oh, God. I I could go with any of these. This is the start of some great momentum. It, it is. When we add the Stanley Cup. I, ugh, okay, that's tempting. That's tempting fate with EA. When is a very, very strong word. <laughs> oh, God. I'm proud of them, but it's true. It won't mean anything if we choke. Russell's not too happy about it, but it's true. It's true. We need to win from here. The President's Trophy doesn't mean anything if you lose, which 99% of President's Trophy winners do lose. Anyway, let's take a look at the stats on the season, starting off with Marvin Mason. 102 points on the year <laughs> in 79 games. Oh, my God. So 35 points in his rookie year, 51 points last year. He doubled it. He doubled it. 43 goals, a plus 54. He shot 16%, 24 of those points on the power play. Marvin Mason, ladies and gentlemen. And then we have Cody Glass, who has made the decision as to who gets traded very, very difficult because he has only improved and was supposed to be one of the faces of the series. But from 41 points in his rookie year, 45, then jumping up to 73, 82 last year, and now 94 points. A career high of 24 goals, a plus 46 with 29 points coming on the power play. It's crazy. It's crazy. And then we get to the to the big dog. <laughs> Russell Clausen. The the new face of the NHL. Also, I want to call him the big dog from now on because he's 5'11. 106 points. From 30 goals in his rookie year to 40 goals in his sophomore year to 56 Goals in his junior year. He's going to score 60 next year. I'm calling it now. 106 points. A plus 49. Craziness. Shot 19%. 31 points on the power play. 20 of his 56 goals were on the power play. One of the best individual seasons we've ever had. This puts him into Nikita Gusev territory from the Ottawa series. Unreal. That top line's unreal. I'm a little bit disappointed that Cody didn't hit the 100-point mark as well, but it's okay. Tate Dwyer on the second line, who, in fairness, some people are some people are already saying maybe he should be the one to go instead of Cody Glass, which, I mean, hey, if we you know, imagine, though, we turned a third-round pick and Tate Dwyer into whatever the hell we were to get, he actually took a little bit of a step back this season. He had nine points in 22 games when we called him up for that playoff run. And 64 points in his first full year, back-to-back 82-point -back seasons. This year, only 77 points. Only 77 points. God forbid he's not a point-of-game player, right? But still, a plus 27 on the season, the highest of his career. He had the highest shooting percentage of his career. 19 points on the power play. A great season for Tate Dwyer. Uh, that's more... That's, that's more than we normally get out of our top-line players in some other series. So, phenomenal for him. Victor Goldobin. The one big name without a contract heading into the next year. 41 points in his rookie year, 55 points, and now 79 points. A plus 37, 20 points on the power play. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. And Elijah Lackey hit 69 points. Say it with me now. 3, 2, 1. Nice. 33 goals. Not a career high. He put up 43 in his rookie year. He ties his rookie point total, but a plus 27, 18 points on the power play. A tremendous season as well. So that top six is as dominant of a unit as we've ever seen, I think, in any of my series at this point. We go to the third line where Josh Fotinos was able to put up 32 points. And we have to we have to grade this on a scale here, right? Because if you look at his attributes, you could say, oh, he underperformed. No. No. Trust me, I'm not going to say he underperformed. He didn't. He did very well. 
uh, for the ice time that he had. 32 points, even though he had 41 last year. Still a, you know, a really strong season. He only had one point on the power play from the deadline onward, which is pretty disappointing. Maybe we'll look to take him off that unit. But getting him into a better spot in that top six is the debate. Or potentially dealing him is also a debate. Because there's no doubt about it. Having him on the third line is a waste. Having this as our third line is a little bit of a waste because we're not getting the most out of these guys. We can have Verbata, Fedorov, and Datsuk be the third line, have them put up 30 points and get the most out of them, whereas with Fotino, Suzuki, and Roach, no matter how they've done this season, we know that if they were playing top six minutes and if they were on the power play, they'd be producing at an even higher level, which is why we have that major decision coming our way. But we get to Nick Suzuki, 9 goals, 26 assists, good for 35 points, so a drop down, uh, but that's not surprising at all. Still a strong year for him, and Gregory Roach actually still had a great year, 42 points down from the 59 he had last year, but still a very strong season for everybody. There's not one person that I'm disappointed in thus far. Dominic Verbata hit 20 points, which, hell, if you hit 10 or 15, given how prolific our offense is, I would have been fine with it. But Verbata in his rookie year, 20 points. Good stuff after a 63-point season last year. Maxim Fedorov, case in point. You give him third line ice uh, third, yeah, third line ice time, he'll be fine. He hit 35 points on the fourth line, 21 goals. Craziness. And Kirill Datsuk also hit 24 points. Of course, four goals, 20 assists. Ha ha, it's the weed number. But 24 points in his rookie year. No doubt that these guys on the third line could do well. Not to mention, uh, between Robertson, Dubé, Bembridge, Rizzi, Steos, I mean, we have guys that should be on the fourth or third line. So, yeah, we'll take a look at the AHL numbers in a moment. We're set up so well. So, so well. Defensively, Shea Theodore with 26 points on the year, finished at a plus 35. So, his numbers were actually down from what he did last year, but given how well our offensive lines performed. It's not that surprising. Provorov, our big free agent signing, 56 points and a plus 50. I do not regret that signing by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> He's worth the money. He is absolutely worth the money. That's crazy. Rositas, up to an 84 at 19 years old. Only had 14 points, but I'm okay with that. Up from the 10 he had last year. His career NHL plus minus is 77. Two years in. That has to be an NHL record, right? That's ridiculous. <laughs> he was with Isaiah Norton who had 18 points. He was a plus 38 on the season. Not a career high. He had 19 points in his rookie year, but still a strong year for him. Eric Bronstrom with 33 assists on the year. Again, he had 49 last year, but he was in much more of a prolific role, much more important role. That said, he still had power play time this year, and he only had nine points on the power play, which is shocking. because He's been on the power play all season, so I don't know what's up with that. And then Gertz and eight goals, four assists, kind of a weird number for weird numbers for a defenseman, uh, plus 10 on the year. Goaltending-wise, a lot of eyes were on Andre Vasilevsky, rightfully so. 68 appearances, 47 wins, and a 927 save percentage. But what will happen in the playoffs is the question. Time will tell. Uh, Yannick Kapainen did not do well as a backup by any stretch of the imagination, just to use that saying again. Uh, there is pressure on him from the likes of Dirksen and Gervais Schwenard. Whether or not Kapainen's around long term, time will tell. Gervais Schwenard had a phenomenal season. Dirksen, not so much. But he, you know, he's, he's 22. They're both still 22. So time will tell. Not to mention Oscar Havlid was here for the rest of the year. He had one appearance and did quite well. Uh, a quick look at the AHL numbers, even though their season's not quite over. Hudson Bembridge is ready for the NHL. Derek Steos with 28 goals. Rizzi had a great season. Tyler Wong isn't even a player that we you know really care about. He's actually not under contract to us. Uh, Ole Hatainen with 30 points. A great season for Justice Kane. Like I said before, we're near prospect factory territory in terms of we have some real high-level players that we have to get rid of, but that we have to get rid of for picks and prospects because it doesn't make sense to go out and acquire somebody better. The point is, there are already people on roster better than them. So, of course, we're going to be getting back picks and prospects for these guys, 
and then they'll be replacing the dudes that are currently in the AHL, and hence the term prospect factory. Let's take a look. Before we get into the playoffs, we will at least sim through the first round in this episode. Let's take a look at the season point totals as Russell Clausen led the league. Kucherov gave him one hell of a fight. Mason was up there as well. McDavid and Stamkos. So Tampa is a threat on the other side. Cody Glass was up there. Then you have Brock Besser. Cyrus acted with Holters in Colorado. Also with Oscar Bjorkstrand, Pablo Beagle. There's a lot of high-level talent, especially in the Western Conference right now. Goalie-wise, I mean, I imagine Vassie's up there for wins, and indeed he is. In terms of save percentage, he was the best goalie in the league. Granted, tied with Holtby, but Vasilevsky had more appearances. Uh, each of their goals against average was identical, by the way. Uh, Vassie did face more shots, so I'm giving it to him. He also gave up more goals, but there you go. In terms of the rookie race, it's going to be a mod Kang. Beating out guys like Grayson Wall and Ryder Clark in Carolina. Hell, Casey Mullen as well at 56 points each. So with that, we pretty much have the full season recap. I think every team had played 82 games. Yeah, they had. All right, cool. So it's not like I looked at the stats too early. We're good to go. Let's find out. Although, granted, for the, again, the AHL, their season's not over. Who's it going to be? It's Colorado. It is Colorado. Yikes. Especially after just seeing uh, Cackers and the other dude on that team. I am now a little bit concerned. We will turn off Fog of War in the meantime so that we can get an accurate look at their stats or attributes. But before we do that, I'm actually going to double check our penalty kill setup. That was our one weakness. Somewhat. It wasn't even like that big of an Achilles heel, but still. So it's Fedorov, Roach, Glass, and Datsuk. That's just a really weird combination. i got to be honest. I think we're going to be super aggressive. I think we're going to be super aggressive. And we... I mean, here's the thing, right? You can either send out your top units to go up against their top units... Or you can send out your bottom six guys, and then that way you get the chance of, oh, okay, well, after the power play, now our top six gets to go after their bottom six because their top six is tired from the power play. Basic understanding of power play and penalty kill strategy, right? But because it's the playoffs, because I'm very much afraid of Colorado's offense, uh, we're going to take the approach of fighting fire with fire. So Glass and Claussen will be the top PK units. And I think from there we're going to have Gold Dobin. And you could argue Elijah Lackey. You can argue Dwyer, but we're going to put Mason out there as well. So, again, fighting fire with fire. And defensively, uh, Provorov, Rositas. Provorov is actually with Theodore. Rositas and Norton. Okay, let's, uh, let's put Provorov with uh, Shea Theodore. And that way our second defense pair will be the ones that are good to go in case we need them. And again for the... Actually, Klaassen can take face-offs. So let's put Klaassen in there. And we'll take out Lubomir Rositas and bring on Shea Theodore. A fire with fire approach. We'll see if it works. And actually, let's look at the power play as well. Fotinos didn't do much. Neither really did Bronstrom on the power play. How did Theodore do in terms of power play points? Only five. So it looks like our defensemen aren't really doing that well in terms of power play production. So, I'm going to do something a little bit crazy here. We're going to take out Bronstrom. And we are going to put Gregory Roach there, who had a great season. Shea Theodore is going to sit for Nick Suzuki. And Josh Fotinos can stay, <laughs> I guess. It's kind of a tough call. Fotinos didn't do much, though. I think maybe I'll put Bronstrom back. But I'm going to give Roach and Suzuki an opportunity here on the power play. So let's have... Yeah, let's just keep Roach and Suzuki there, and I think we're good, maybe. Actually, I'm going to go like this. We'll see if this works. Mason can play center, can he not? He can. I'd rather have Klaassen's shot. Which is a little bit better than Mason's. But just for the sake of having the potential one tees, granted the AI aren't exactly great about one-timers, 
but we'll see what happens. We'll have Lackey at center there, and that's going to be the power play unit heading in to this matchup. So some minor changes to the special teams, maybe not so minor, but still, I feel as though that had to be done. Let's take a look at what we're up against. The Colorado Avalanche here in the first round. Let's see what we're dealing with. Oh boy. Okay. This this could be rough. Oscar Bjorkstrand, 23 years old, former number one overall pick, who has been pretty prolific. Two 80-point seasons, including 85 points this year. He has three 30-goal seasons and a 40-goal season. Yeah. Now, case in point here, 89 offensive war, and this has a good shot and good puck skills, but we've had players with those numbers not produce 80-point seasons. So, it is a little bit of random RNG. But then again, not every one of those players has played with Nathan McKinnon, who's still 29 years old. How did he do this year? I imagine great. Yeah, an 81-point season. And Cyrus Ackers, the 23-year-old, at 95 offensive awareness, a former first-round pick, rounds up the top line. Second line is Dylan Cozens with Tyson Jost and Blake Wheeler. Third line of Nolan Foots, Alexander Kerfoot, and Matthias Janmark. Marcus Foligno, Zemgus Gergensens, and Colby Godfrey round out the offense. I've said it before. This is the type of team, well-rounded as they are, with a couple of game changers offensively, that can beat any team in the playoffs. It's just the way the sim works. Are we the better team offensively? Yes, but the the game doesn't care. So we'll we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Defensively, there's no doubt we are better. But again, off of that offense, I don't know. Uh, again, I like to be optimistic for this uh, for this episode, or started to be optimistic for this episode. I like to have started this episode in an optimistic way. This kind of hurts a little bit. So Nikita's the door off is with Sam Girard. Second pairing is Patrick Nemeth with Colin Miller, of course, and Dominic Mashin is with Connor Timmins. Colin Miller is, God, he's going to be playing for revenge. The goaltender is, oh my God, Keith Kincaid with Frank Hansen. This team is so balanced towards offense, so heavily weighted towards outscoring their opponents. There's no doubt we're the better team. Our goaltending is light years ahead in terms of overall. Our defense is better. Our offense is better. We should win this series. But this game often doesn't care for favorites. So we'll see. Oh, boy. Let's, uh, let's go with we can do this. Motivating. Yeah, people don't like the motivating. I needed to get Russell, ba uh, Russell back into good form. I want to take a look. At the overall ratings, we're obviously not going to play 99, 97, 94 against 95, 90, and an 84. We should win this. We should absolutely 100% win this. Damn. By the way, actually here, let me check one other thing. One final thing before we get into this. Tate Dwyer is currently captain. I'm going to piss him off a little bit. Maybe. I won't for now, for the sake of morale. But I'm going to have you guys officially vote at the beginning of next season for who should be the captain and the alternates. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say like one defenseman uh, and two forwards, which is normally how I like to do it. But we'll figure that out later. For now, I'm not going to mess up the morale. But people were talking about that before. Let's wait until those major changes have to come down before doing that. So again, our sole focus... It's right here, right now, game one here at home. This place was a goddamn fortress, which means our pregame uh, our pregame presentation is that much more accurate. Let's see if that continues. First period of game one against Colorado, and it's a goal apiece. Kirill Datsuk gets the opening goal. Kerfoot was able to tie it. They outshot us 9-8. Second period, good lord. <laughs> <laughs> this team is capable of just going off offensively at any time. Marvin Mason, two goals for Josh Fotinos in a... I mean, come on, man. Come on. My God, dude. My God. 24 seconds apart? Craziness. Ackers, good old Cackers, was able to get the goal back. 
but it's 4-2, to 23 shots to 18 as we begin this third period, and Dylan Cousins gets them back to within one. I am now concerned. Power play chance here goes to waste, and Tyson Jost ties it. Vasilevsky is letting us down here. Four goals is unacceptable. Can our offense dig us out of this? Power play for the Avs is not capitalized on, and we go to overtime here in game one. Four goals apiece. I'm not going to jump into the sim. I'm going to save that for a potential elimination scenario, and for the fact it's already been a somewhat, you know, I mean, the episode's already into it, right? It's not a playoff-only episode. So let's do this. Will it end early? My, my nominee is for winners. Tate Dwyer or Dylan Cousins. Cousins, Cousins, here we go. Come on. Come on, Bassey. You better not. You better not. Power play chance for the Knights. And there we go. It's Marvin Mason. One of the big names at the very least gets it done. 44 shots to 29. A 5-4 to four win in overtime as we take game one. Barely. Mason with two goals. Fotinos with two goals. We get the job done. I said or asked what kind of Vasilevsky would we see in the playoffs. If that Vasilevsky continues to show up, we are screwed. If that Vasilevsky continues to show up, the decision on who to trade at the draft becomes much, much easier now, doesn't it? So he is playing for his job here. Because this team is going places, with or without him. And if he's going to be that much of a detriment, damn it, we'll do it without him. So Vassy, you've been put on notice. Get the job done. As the Chicago Wolves apparently finished first in their conference. We'll try like hell to remember to follow along with them when we get the opportunity. But for now, full steam ahead. Game two. No lineup changes necessary. We just need Vasilevsky to have a much better performance. Well, let's go. First period, and that's not great. Two goals for Bjorkstrand. Marvin Mason, though, gets a goal back with six seconds left. We were outshot 14-6, to six, but still, we need a better performance from Vasilevsky. Second period, that helps a lot. <laughs> we'll be going into the third period with a 4-2 to lead for the second consecutive game. It was Gertzen, Cody Glass, and Kirill Datsuk, who is doing very well so far. 4-2, to two. they're out shooting us 24-20, but we have the two-goal lead yet again. This time, Vassi, you have the chance to redeem yourself. This time, you have the chance to do it right. Shut the door, and let's head to Colorado with a 2 to nothing series lead, please. But it is nice to see guys like Datsuk chipping in. Cackers with the goal. Colorado's back in at power play chance. It's an extended power play that goes to waste. Seven minutes left. Can we hold on? Vasilevsky, I swear to God. I swear to God. Shut the door. Don't let them in. Thank you very much. A little bit scary with that goal. Start from Cackers. But we hold on. We get the win. Four to three. We successfully defend our home ice. And now we head to Colorado with this 2 to nothing series lead. A three-point night for both Bjorkstrand and Cackers, but it was not enough. So there we go. A decent start to this series. I wouldn't say that letting up seven goals is ideal, but hey, we scored nine, so we got that working out for us. Let's maybe, you know, I'm not making changes. I'm not making changes. I don't even care, like, the plus minus of our defensemen. Nothing. Let's go. We're good enough. We can beat this team. Clearly, we can beat any team in the league on any given night. Let's just get the job done. First period of Game 3 here in Colorado is scoreless. How many people predicted that? 13 shots to 8 in their favor. Second period, and they have the opening goal, Nathan McKinnon, with 8 seconds left. 20 shots to 18, and a one to nothing lead for the Avalanche. As we begin the third... Can our offense get going? Power play chance goes to waste. Colorado with a short, actually a full power play of their own. An extended power play that they can't score on as we're halfway through the third period. Are we going to get shut out by Keith freaking Kincaid here in game three? 
That is apparently the case. Wow. So if Vasilevsky doesn't show up, our offense shows up. If our offense doesn't show, Vasilevsky holds them to one goal and an empty netter. This team should be embarrassed. Bottom line, with that defense and that goaltending, our team should be embarrassed. Keith Kincaid should not be shutting out this offense. No. Just no. Not no way. Not no how. Yet it happened. And Colorado's back in this series because of it. If I take a look here, Claussen doesn't have a goal yet. That needs to change. Tate Dwyer doesn't have a point yet. Our second line has been brutalized. Lackey and Dwyer have not shown up. So we need to decide if tough love is the best way to go here, especially when our fourth line has at least produced some points. And I gotta be honest, I think that might be the way to go. Fotino Suzuki, you know what? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. You guys are getting dropped. Claussen, you have a chance here in this next game. We need a goal from you. We need a goal. Defend these, I will. Top pairing hasn't been what it has been throughout the entire run. Now, I'm going to flip them back. You get a chance to redeem yourself in game four. If you don't get the job done and Colorado ties this series, I will be looking at changes because I'll be damned if we're going to get shut out by Keith Kincaid. I will view it on this one instance as a fluke. Prove me wrong. Get this win so that I don't have to make any lineup changes. First period of game four, and we do get the opening goal, and it's Marvin Mason. Good stuff. 16 shots to eight, a much better performance. Second period, they tie it with Tyson Jost. Russell Claussen is on the board. Thank you very much. 30 shots to 21. Two to one on the board. Let's do this. Will we have a three to one series lead? Heading back to Vegas. T -t -t to Vegas for game five. Oh my god, Dylan Cousins. Kirill Datsuk ties it nine seconds or restores the lead nine seconds later. Actually, a minute nine seconds later, in fairness. I don't even know what's going on anymore. You get the point. I want that 3-1 to one series lead and not a two-all tie heading back home. Can Vassi shut the door? Yes, he can. Kirill Datsuk is stepping up in a major way. 44 shots to 29. No crazy shutout this time. And we are one game away. From the second round, a solid, not great, but solid performance from Vasilevsky. And Russell Claussen shows up when he was needed. As Gertsen goes down to injury, Eklund will be stepping in for him, which isn't the worst case scenario, really. Could be a lot worse. As the AHL regular season has come to a close, we'll actually take a quick look here. They're going to be playing Rockford. Right. I mean, we kind of already looked at their you know, stats for the season. So, Chicago, I'm sorry for the moment. You take the back seat because we have a chance to end the series here in five games. Let's see. Let's see. We have to put the series behind us and build uh, to build momentum for the next round immediately. Our fans are excited. The sponsors are excited. I am excited. You're excited. Let's give the people what they want. A lot of our players on this team don't like people. But the fans are excited and the sponsors are excited, so we're good to go. Let's do this. Game five. No lineup changes still. Just get the job done. We know you can. We know you're capable of it. Let's do this. I believe. First period of game five. And we do get the opening goal. And it's Russell Claussen stepping up when we needed him to step up. The outshot is 12 to 10, but we do have the one to nothing lead. Second period. Right. Fotinos and Fedorov, two goals in under a minute to make it three to nothing, but a late comeback from the Avs. Two goals in 40 seconds for Jost and Yanmark, and they're within one. Shots are basically even. We are 20 minutes away from either winning this series, uh, knowing that we're going to a sixth game, or overtime. Let's find out which, as Colorado has an early power play chance, go to waste. They have another one here as we can't stay out of penalty trouble. We're one goal away from potentially sealing this. A door off tie. The Avs have come back from 3-0 down to tie it in the third period. Can we win this in regulation? No, we cannot. 
No, we cannot. <sighs> All right. We're being outshot. We've blown a three to nothing lead. I'm not going to jump into it. Let's just get it done. I don't care who scores. Let's do this. Come on. We got this. We have to have this. Fassie shut the door and somebody get the job done. It's Goldobin on the power play. And we have eliminated the Colorado Avalanche in five games. They get one win off of a ridiculous shutout from Keith Kincaid. But in the end, the best team wins out as they should have. Good stuff. Good stuff. One slip up and that's all it was. We didn't let them back into the series. In fairness, there were a couple more slip ups than just one. But one major slip up. We got the job done. We got the job done. <sighs> we faced adversity and triumph. We did. We did face adversity. We got shut out. We came back. People don't like that approach. But damn it, that's how I'd answer it. And if you don't like it, kick rocks. Let's take a look at how the team did before we find out who we're playing in round two in the next episode. So Mason was tremendous. Cody Glass was great. Russell Clausen stepped up in the last two games. Good stuff. Tate Dwyer, not great. Victor Goldobin, solid. Elijah Lackey and Tate Dwyer are just not getting it done. But as I always say, we won in five games, mind you, without them performing. What happens if they get their game together? That's the question. Fotino's three goals, two points for Suzuki, three points for Roach. Not a, uh, not a great effort? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, I think we'd look to make changes with the second and third line. Uh, Verbata, four points, two points for Fedorov and the three goals, four points for Kirill Datsu. Great stuff. So if we had to, I mean, obviously Dwyer Lackey, the easy solution, swapping them with Fotinos and Roach, that might be the case. Defensively, Shea Theodore needs to be better. Only one point and a minus one. Provorov, one point and a minus five. We can't have you be falling apart in the playoffs, buddy. Rosita's no points and a plus one. Norton, no points and a plus one. Two points and an even rating for Bronstrom and nothing from Eklund in his one game. Our defense needs to be better, clearly. And so does Andre Vasilevsky. It's not often you make it out of the first round with your goalie having a 920 save percentage. It's a, it's a rarity. It is a rarity, but we were able to get the job done. Of course, we did lose Taylor Gertzen to injury. He had one point and was a plus two. He will be back for this next series. So with that, we're done here. I will see you guys in the next episode where we take on whomever. Uh, although, you know what? We're not done here. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and sit. Let's find out who we're playing. Screw it. I won't cliffhanger you on that. Uh, we will see if the Chicago Wolves are in trouble, which they are. Unfortunately, the trend of an AHL team continuing to do well, only to, you know, kind of screw it up continues. Let's stop the sim. Will Rockford season end? Let's find out. And let's find out who we're playing. It's Vancouver, to the surprise of nobody. The Chicago Wolves are out. A very disappointing end to their season. But as expected, Vancouver makes it through Edmonton, and it is a battle of the titans in the Pacific. End of the Wolf Division. You talk about underperforming players and how everything went in this first round series. If anybody underperforms in this next round, we are done. Vegas and Vancouver Again, we have already seen a disappointing end of the Wolves season as they finished as the best team in the conference and nearly the best team in the league. We can't afford another disappointment like that. We need to postpone all of these roster changes for as long as possible. Thank you guys for watching. I will see you in the next one. Until then, have a good one. Goodbye.